were talking about the different types of unrepresentative sampling and why you might want to do them. Convenience sampling being one, you just find somebody. Uh, if you are in the journalism school, they talk about it as the MOS interview, the man on the street. Well, I guess they should call it POS, but that means something else these days, I guess, uh, for person on the street. But that basically is just getting some data that's out there. Purpose of sampling happens a bit more where you're interested in the target population. <clears throat> so you will select people with a given characteristic. For example, people at Mizzou who consume 20 or more drinks in a sitting. Generally speaking, those people do exist at Mizzou. They tend to be male, first-generation college students, and heavily involved with our fraternity system. Snowball sampling, we find one person and say, hey, do you know anybody else who has this problem or is like you in some way? And quota sampling, where you're going to sample so that you have a sample of individuals that somewhat represents the population that you have at the end. The only small addition I would make to that comment about quota sampling is that sometimes by experimental design, we might sample so that we have enough people in each category in order to have a statistically powerful test of what we're looking at. So as we were talking about before, if you're looking at a validity claim, external validity is really important if you're going to be making a frequency claim. But where you're not necessarily trying to say some statement about everybody in the United States, kind of decrease that so you can see my comments. Uh, you don't really need to have a population that really represents the sample. So non-probability samples in the real world exist. And you might think about how that's going to affect your conclusions about what you want to infer. Non-probability samples and research samples are there by design quite frequently. And you know, we are aware that the populations of people who we have are not entirely typical of the population as a whole. So if we're looking at our samples, I had mentioned statistical power in designs that are quota sampling where you might want to have equal numbers of men and women. And if you have smaller samples, that's going to give you more unstable estimates and larger margins of error. You have taken a class in statistics, <clears throat> all of you, or it's equivalent. And that mysterious word called the standard error pops up quite a bit, or the standard error of the estimate. And the standard error of the estimate is just a fancy phrase for saying, how much do I expect my estimate, my statistic, like a mean or a standard deviation or a correlation coefficient to jump around if I do my study again? And if you have a smaller sample, the standard errors of your estimates <clears throat> are going to be by definition larger. As a matter of fact, as you increase the sample size, that standard error is going to be affected in almost all cases by a factor of the square root of n, where n is your sample size. This has some implications for how you do your research. It's important, for example, that we have <clears throat> analyses that are sensitive to important subgroups and to assess the degree to which the conclusions that we want to have in our study generalize to different types of people. If, for example, you're going out and putting together a grant application to the federal government, you have to say, you have, you have a section in there that talks about representativeness. To some extent, 
you know, we want to be careful that our results generalize to various minority populations, for example. It's been recently raised, my, my daughter, who's very much into gender studies, forwarded me lots of articles about how we are starting now to include female <laughs> laboratory animals in our study of pharmaceuticals. And it might surprise you to learn that an awful lot of pharmaceutical work looks only at male rats, male mice. And why do they do that? Well, male animals do not have hormonal cycles. And those hormonal cycles of levels of hormones being up and down and activity levels varying as a function of hormone levels mean that there's going to be more variation in performance of a female animal over the course of time. But it's really important to include females in your study because you know they are different than the males and the dangers might be different for female animals than they are for males. And that makes things very complicated. So do you try by means of diet usually or exposure to light and circadian rhythms to put all of your laboratory animals on the same hormonal cycle? Because you don't want them all on separate, separate cycles because as I mentioned, that's going to create more variation and you know, create a larger standard deviation in the variables, which therefore reduces your power. Uh, so it means you know, there's a little more work there, but in order to make it more representative, you know, that work is, is worthwhile. By definition though, also, because subgroups of people, old people, people with disabilities, minority po other minority populations, because they're smaller samples, the standard errors on statistics gathered on smaller subgroups are going to be larger. So even though you may design a study and say, well, here is how I think the numbers are going to shake out, your ability to actually identify differences as to how, for example, Hispanic students have a different lived experience on campus than the majority population. Your study isn't going to be well powered to detect that. And that's just a fact of life. This is another argument for doing quota sampling. So you might say, even though I believe Mizzou's student population is at this point 87% white, you may want to oversample Black, Hispanic, and Asian populations. Speaking of Asian populations, that's another issue where we need to be careful. To refer to someone as an Asian American or to require, as the registrar here does, that an individual identify as Asian is somewhat puzzling because the term Asian is not a term that people in that group would use to describe themselves. For example, if you talk to a person from China and you say, oh, aren't you Japanese? The reaction is very swift and strong that no, they are not Japanese. And, and the reverse is also true. Japanese people do not like to be confused for being Chinese. And the Korean population on campus here is also its own thing. And each of these societies and cultures are different things with different traditions, different social structures. And that, you know, in some sense, Mizzou is kind of unique in that we have a rather large Korean population. And this comes to us because Harry Truman was from Missouri and president during the Korean conflict. So we have a variety of collaborative relationships with Korean institutions. But even so, we don't have enough Koreans here on campus, or Korean Americans on campus, to really have a sample that's going to allow us to correctly identify, oh, in this way, our psychological theory might not necessarily apply to individuals from this culture.
So you know, that covers more or less what I had wanted to say about chapters six and seven. Are there any questions on that? So let's come back now and rejoin. I guess I'll come back into this. Sometimes you might be interested in making your own survey for your own research. So Google Forms is available out there. I have sent you a link to a Google Form. And You can you know, go into it, select personal, and this will then put you into a menu of possible options. The templates upstairs here are really kind of a nice place to start. And I wanted to walk you through some of the possibilities on that. I made an example of a Google form here. Anytime you make it, it's automatically saved. And to edit that and look at it, we can click on this. And here we have some example questions that I've had. So what I'd like to do is to kind of walk you through that. And I've got to move the Zoom controls out of the way here. One of the places to start is over here on the right-hand tab. and you can, yeah, I'm sorry. First of all, you can give your form a name. So you can just type into this section and, and you can change the, the, the title for the individual form you have. To add a question, you can come over here to this little button and say, add a question. You can also import a question from text if you have a Word document that your research team is working on. And you also have some control over a title and description for your question. You can also insert an image, as I have done down here. And you can also even insert a video. If you're asking a lot of questions, and often in research you are, you can have a section. So we'll just kind of walk through what these options are for a moment. So. In this particular case, I put in two sections in this questionnaire and I gave this section a name and you can click on this, you can duplicate it, you can move this section around so you can take the section and all the questions that follow and put it in a different part. You can also delete the entire section. Coming down here, you can then put in a question. So by hitting the add question button, if I just do that now, that will add a question down here. You can put in the question. And you can then pick the format. And there's a variety of formats that we'll be walking through. You can have a short answer or a paragraph or multiple choice, check boxes that are different than multiple choice and that you can select more than one option, a drop down menu, you can also put a file in there if you want. The linear scale is what we would call a Likert format. The multiple choice grid is shown below that allows you to say a number of rows and then you select inside of that. The checkbox is like the multiple choice grid, except you get to check a number of them. So we'll talk about that. And you can also ask questions in date or time format. If you want to get rid of that question, down here, I can I should be able to delete this question like any control Z. If you're doing this inside of Psych One, you will want to have that individual collect report their email address. And you can kind of change the settings on that if you would like. Up here in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little cog sign that says settings. 
And so inside of that, you can say, all right, do you want to collect email addresses or not? And after that has been sent, do you want the people who are being sent, who are participating to get an acknowledgement back? So if you're doing this, this with a student population, you probably want to select this because that way they can say, I got this receipt, I did participate. <clears throat> you can also allow the people who participate to edit after they have submitted the form. And at the end of the day, you can also allow them to see the summary charts or text responses on the survey. Probably for a research study, you don't want to collect, you don't want to click that button. Uh, but if you're just doing an informal survey, like you're being a teaching assistant or inside of your business, you're doing a quick survey of the people in your office uh, and sometimes your customers, you might want to allow them to see that summary. So just to kind of walk through what these options are. You can control the formatting. You can say it's centered or left aligned or right aligned. So if I want to center it, I can center my little picture and put that in here. This little button here allows you to add the picture if you would like. Inside of a picture, you can come in and grab the bars and make it smaller and larger, should you wish. And you can allow people to see the format. So no, and if you want to add another option, like maybe you can click that option in here and do that. Another format is time format. So you can ask people a question that inside of here, they can put in a time. Uh, you, can import, you can embed a video should you like. This is an example of a checkbox. So you can say, where do you usually study? And you can pick one of these options. This is a check all that apply one. If you have, in this example, maybe three friends and you want to know what types of alcohol they consume, they can then click those options. You can put in your birthday and it'll ask for month, day, and year. And here's an example of a Likert format question. Um, you can also allow people in a drop down box to say if they, you know, to give their answers. And you can have short answers texts. So that's just an example of the various formats. If we want, after you have your questions entered in, you can come up here to this little eyeball and you can preview the study. And this isn't going to you know, gather the data for you, but you can make sure that it's gonna look the way you would like it for, your, for the people who are taking your test. You, know, you can allow people to you can even play around with the answers and make sure that those answers are working the way you would like. Downstairs in terms of the time, you can have people put in you know, six o'clock in the middle of the night morning, and you can have them select AM or PM. You can have them watch the video that they might have. Okay. And you can also test out to make sure that, you know, only one, only one response is an option for something. So in this one, I guess I allowed them to have more than one response. Uh, and similarly, oh, I guess I reversed it. So in this case, what do they usually drink? There's only one option there. Putting in the birthday is fine. Person can put it in either as numbers, you know, month, day, and year, or they can come in and click the little button and you can select it. So, you know, given how old I am, you'd have to be you know, doing Wheel of Fortune spins to get to that. So it's a little bit easier for someone to put something in like that. Um, and this is an example of the drop down box. You, know, you can select yes or no. And then if I want to have a short answer, they can have that text in there. Hitting the next button takes you to section two. At least it should. Oh, it wants me to put in. OK. 
Okay. And here are some examples of, you know, the second section that I put in. So oh, here are some examples of questions that illustrate ways you don't want to word survey items. And I have the chat open. What's wrong with this first question? That's like a forced answer question. Well, it's kind of threatening, yeah. And well, they do, they can say maybe. Or maybe like leading question. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a value judgment in there. I mean, what's another way to ask the question? Well, and Kyle, you're right. There is kind of two points to this. It's a leading question, right? Thank you, Sierra. So how would we ask it? Yes. Grace writes, have you attended every class? What grade did you get? It's probably a cleaner way of splitting it out. So what's wrong with this next one? It is not the case that class lectures are not hard to understand. Not a double negative. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you really have to think twice before you're going to have that answer. So how would you fix it? Just word it more simply like, are class lectures hard to understand? Mm -hmm. Yep. And, you know, it's important to also think about the fact that you might get different responses on even a yes, no question like that if you don't focus on the negative. So if you say, you know, it's not the same thing to say our class lectures hard to understand as it is to say I was able to understand class lectures or class lectures are easy to understand. You're going to get slightly different values in each of those. What about have you stopped amusing your pet? Then the question implies that you already beat your cat. Yeah. And it's, I was trying to think of a way to also, you know, think about all the ways that that's kind of wrong. You might not have a pet. And, you know, it assumes a history and so forth. Well, what about, do you think a healthy economy is good for our state and opening all restaurants and bars to 100% capacity is a good idea? That's a double-barreled question. Exactly. So if we close this out, at the end of the day, you can come up here and you can then start, you have a few options. You can copy your questionnaire. You can come in and you can send the questionnaire out with pre-filled responses to everything. Probably not a great idea if you're doing research because you're probably going to get the answer back. If other people have a Google account, or they're willing to log in from some other platform like Missouri.edu, you can add collaborators. So you can all be working on the form. You can get fancy and come in and edit the script that would talk about when you're going to be answering these things and so forth. 
You can print things out. You can print it out as a Word document so that you, know, you have a copy that you can take to research meetings and show people. Uh, drop down menus appear as different. Let's see, where was that at? Appear as things to fill out um, inside of what you're looking at. And you can then send this in a variety of ways. You can either email it to people directly. You can do as I did before, and you can get the link to share it. And you can put it inside of a message to send to people. And you can embed that inside of an HTML link. So if you wanted to send somebody a link and then you know, copy and paste this in there when they click on that, that's going to take them directly to the form. So what I would like you to do, I see five people have already done this, is I would like you, if you haven't done already, just to kind of go through and breeze through that link and fill it out. In the interim, if we come over here and take a look at our responses, this is what we have so far. And you get these little pie charts out of there. And, you know, nice little bar charts that are summaries. And the answers. So you, you have some statistics that you can go back and get answers back to people. You can come up here and you can then take the spreadsheet, take the data that you have, and I'll kind of refresh this. Got eight people so far who are multitasking. And it will give you, you know, the option to create a spreadsheet and you'll then have the data. So this comes in as a comma delimited file, and you're seeing you have text in here. Working with that text is sometimes a little bit hard for people to be doing uh, in reading it into statistical programs. If you want to get into this some more, you can easily inside of statistics programs like SPSS or R or SAS, read in date time format so it will keep track of things for you. When you have checkboxes, it's going to give you, you know, all of the possible responses and what you know that were given for friend one, friend two, friend three. Um, and, and there is your questions out there. Okay. So do you have any questions about that? On this, these data would then be what you save um, as you are doing your data as part of your human subjects training. You know, this becomes live data. It's important that you have it secure and inside of your laboratory. In other words, don't save the data on your phone and don't save it on your computer. Uh, in the before times, we would make sure that people were, you know, save in the laboratory and saving the data for a given project on computers in the lab so it was secure. That's a little bit more difficult now to do that. Inside of Google's calendar work and inside of Microsoft Excel, it's possible to save things like Excel spreadsheets in, an, in a password protected form. So even if somebody gets a hold of the file, they can't get into the data unless they know the password. Okay. Okay. So you know, filling out that form is something I want you to do because that way I'll know to grade it for the activity for the class. Um, so be sure and do that if you attended today. Any questions on this? The last YouTube video for Monday's lecture, it was still uploading, and I guess I'll have to start it again, uh, but I'll update the syllabus when I have that. And I have not heard back yet from 
the campus computing folks and the educational technology folks to allow people to skip around on items, questions inside of assessments. So that's still an outstanding tab for me. Do you have any questions about this? Okay. Uh, we will hold off on it, but at some point, another activity would be to ask you to actually make a form and do some questions. So I'm kind of hoping that that would be something you could do. 